For the occasion of my 100th video, I created a special Stalker Iceberg, and I said I would explain its elements eventually. We already covered four layers, along with a bonus surprise layer, so this leaves us with one final part. Hello Stalkers and welcome to the Anomalous Dugout. In this video, we will take a look at the last layer of my Stalker Iceberg, the core. Lebedev replaced Sea Consciousness. There are a lot of theories surrounding the character of Lebedev, the leader of the Clear Sky faction. I already covered some of these theories in a past video, however it turns out that I missed a few of them. In case you don't remember, Lebedev, along with other important members of Clear Sky, used to work in the Zone's secret laboratories before the second disaster, which means that they knew about the experiments and the informational field known as the Noosphere. The scientists from the so-called group connected the minds of some of their members to create the Common Consciousness, an entity capable of interacting with the Noosphere. Their plan was to modify the Noosphere in order to remove negative emotions in the world, but they made a mistake and instead opened a rift in the Noosphere, resulting in the creation of the Anomalous Zone. Following that, we suppose Lebedev and a few others left the group and the center of the zone because they did not agree with their colleagues on how to handle the consequences of the disaster. Thus, Lebedev lost all contact with the scientists of the Sea Consciousness and made his own thing, founding the Clear Sky Faction. However, in fall 2011, Lebedev, along with Scar, led Clear Sky in a push towards the center of the zone, in an attempt to stop Strelok from triggering a new disaster. It seems they were all caught in an emission and most likely died or were brainwashed. But we can wonder what happened to Lebedev. In Shadow of Chernobyl, the representative of the Sea Consciousness bears a striking resemblance with Lebedev, which may indicate that he somehow survived and was taken back in the group. Some even believe this was Lebedev's plan all along. He would have used and manipulated Scar along with his own men in order to get back to the power plant, meet with his former colleagues and find out for himself what was going on there after all these years. Going further, some speculate that Lebedev never cut his ties with the scientists of the group, and Clear Sky was unknowingly working for the Sea Consciousness all along. This could explain how the faction managed to acquire resources powerful enough to reach the center of the zone. Remember, at the beginning of the game they are low on numbers, poorly equipped, and losing a war with the Renegades. Sometime later, they push through Limansk, the hospital and the power plant with a large force of well-armed and well-equipped fighters. Surely Lebedev had to pull some strings to get to this point. Personally, I find it hard to believe that Clear Sky would have been an ally of the Sea Consciousness, because they had to fight their way through hordes of monolith fighters. But who knows? Nevertheless, the theories do not stop there. The Sea Consciousness representative, who could be Lebedev, claims that the bodies connected to Sea Consciousness die. Our resources are not limitless, and the bodies connected to Sea Consciousness eventually die. It is unclear if the scientists die naturally of old age, or if being part of the Sea Consciousness has such a draining effect on your body that it slowly deteriorates. But this seems to be a major problem and concern for the group. That is why the representative wished to recruit Strelok, so that he can donate his body and extend the life of the Sea Consciousness. Knowing this, some stalkers have come with a disturbing theory. After reaching the power plant and somehow surviving the emission, 
Lebedev found the sea consciousness and was asked to join them. He agreed, however he soon discovered the poor condition of his colleagues who, after years of having their consciousnesses connected, were all dying. This was critical because the sea consciousness was the only entity capable of containing the disaster, and without it, the wrath of the zone would unleash. Therefore, Lebedev had no other choice than to replace the dying scientists and take control himself. When Strelok showed up at the power plant a few months later, Lebedev saw an opportunity to find a worthy successor and possibly even free himself from this existence by getting replaced by this young and vigorous stalker. In that case, Lebedev would have been a manipulator to the very end, tricking Strelok into accepting a terrible fate while himself escaping it. Maybe this hand belongs to none other than Lebedev. Eight Generators In this section I was originally going to talk about the generators at the center of the zone, but because I made a video specifically about this topic since then, I decided to change it. Instead, let's discuss the crashed UAV. In Call of Pripyat, you can learn from duty stalkers that an unidentified flying object was spotted not so long ago above Yanov Station. If you explore the area north of the Ash Heap Anomaly, you will find out what the UFO actually was. An unmanned aerial vehicle, or drone which for some unknown reason crashed. According to Urin, a fellow stalker enthusiast who meticulously studied the case of the UAV, this is an American Northrop Grumman RQ-4 Global Hawk. This raises a lot of questions. What was such an aircraft doing in the zone? Who sent it and why? How did it crash? The mystery thickens even more when you find out that the UAV contains a blocked memory module, which after being unlocked by a local technician will reveal the location of three stashes belonging to Strelok and his friends, Ghost and Fang. The explanation behind this is never revealed, however, as always we can speculate. First of all about the data. While very unlikely, it is possible that the drone was actually part of Strelok's group. Fang is rumored to have been a brilliant technician, so perhaps he could have used it to store their secrets, and having such a tool would be very helpful in mapping the zone to discover a safe path towards the center and the CNPP. But as I said, this has very little chance to be true, because how would Strelok's group manage to acquire an American UAV? Another possibility would be that Fang put the data about the stashes inside the aircraft after it crashed. Yet this is also unlikely, as he supposedly died several months ago. Unless the UAV also crashed a long time before the events of Call of Pripyat, in which case the UFO seen by the Dutiers could have been something else. Therefore, I think the most probable explanation is that the drone recorded the information. Maybe its mission was to spy on Strelok and his men, or it just did as a side task while its main objective was something else, like keeping watch and collecting data about the zone, spotting anomalies, scanning the terrain, and so on. As for the operators of the UAV, they were most likely either scientists, military personnel, or even mercenaries. It could have been sent by the US government to check out what was going on in Chernobyl, and who knows if they are among the clients of the mercs. Unfortunately, we have no other clues for now. Then let's get to the more tricky part. How did the UAV manage to fly above the zone and get to Jupiter, and how did it crash? It is well known that aircrafts in the zone have a tendency to crash, especially near the center, 
It is even said that no satellite can fly above the power plant without burning down, due to the massive strength of anomalous interference. We can only imagine that the UAV was lucky to get as far as Jupiter, or it's also possible it used advanced systems of navigation and detectors in order to avoid anomalies. Furthermore, we can learn more by looking at the crash site. The frame is either charred or covered in dirt, with black marks everywhere. The left wing snapped in half and the right one bent, while a large trail points towards the northeast. With this we can conclude that the drone did not explode while flying, so there is very little chance that it was shot down by a missile or rocket or even torn apart by an airborne gravitational anomaly. Thus, in normal conditions, we could conclude that it must have crashed due to fuel exhaustion or engine failure. But this is the zone, so a better explanation would be that it was taken out by an airborne electrical anomaly. This is exactly the same fate as the Stingray choppers, so it makes perfect sense. Yet, I guess, we'll never know for sure. Anomalies are human thoughts. The Earth's noosphere is an informational field containing the consciousnesses of all the inhabitants of the planet. And the zone, that is, the emissions, anomalies and artifacts, are the result of a crack in the Earth's noosphere, which we can assume is leaking in the Chernobyl area. Therefore, and by extension, anomalies are indirectly the products of human thoughts. I suggest watching my detailed video about the noosphere if you haven't seen it. But basically, what I believe is happening is the following. Human thoughts and ideas are generated in the brain, and then stored into the noosphere. However, there is a rift located over the zone which means some of these thoughts fall back into the material world in the form of emissions, which generate anomalies, which in turn generate artifacts. It is unknown if this is a correct interpretation of the noosphere concept in the Stalker universe and how the mechanisms behind the noosphere and the zone actually work, yet we can speculate. If anomalies are indeed powered by the noosphere, which is powered by human consciousnesses, we can wonder what level of influence the human thoughts can have on what is happening in the zone. This is an oversimplification, but imagine that each type of anomaly could be linked to a different emotion. For example, hatred would result in the creation of burners, fear would manifest through electrodes, depression would form fruit punches, and so on. The reality is probably much more complicated. Nevertheless, it's an interesting concept to think about. Notice that I only used negative emotions in my examples. That is because the goal of the sea consciousness when they interacted with the noosphere was to remove such negative emotions. Perhaps they only altered the part of the informational field containing these emotions, explaining why anomalies are so dangerous and why the zone is such a dark and depressing place. We can wonder how different it would have been if they had tried to modify positive emotions instead. In previous videos I have also mentioned that the types of anomalies seem to be connected with their environment. For example, electrodes often spawn near old electrical machinery, chemical anomalies have a tendency to appear in swampy areas, you get the idea. Well, it is possible that the deciding factor is not really the environment itself, but rather the thoughts of people when they come in contact with this environment. Most stalkers would think about electrical danger when approaching old power lines, triggering the operation of electroanomalies. This concept implies that the mindset you adopt in the zone might have an influence on the hazards you will come across. Stalkers such as Hermit and the mysterious shamans mentioned in a PDA entry 
seem to embrace the idea that if you live in the zone with a peaceful mindset, the zone will leave you alone. Maybe this is the secret to avoiding mutants and anomalies, used by legends such as Doctor and Guide. It is also possible that areas in which a lot of strong thoughts and emotions took place in the past are bound to be filled with a specific type of anomaly later on. For instance, the dark rooms of the ex-laboratories where unspeakable horrors have played out are now full of burners. Honestly, I still prefer the idea that the characteristics of an anomaly are defined by its physical environment rather than human thoughts, but it could also be interesting if it's actually a mix of both. It's definitely something that should be documented by the scientists working in the zone. USSR didn't collapse. Alright, I admit, this element is kind of a clickbait, because the USSR did collapse in the Stalker universe. This is confirmed when characters such as Random Stalkers, Krylov or even Sidorovich make mention of the old Soviet times. However, it's very likely that in the alternate reality of Stalker, some of the events following the collapse of the Union were different than in the real world. I'll explain what I mean, but please note that this is a sensitive topic, and I'm not an expert at it, so if I made any mistakes, I'm sorry and feel free to correct me in the comments. From what I observed, the main difference with the real world is the state of the relations between Ukraine and Russia, mostly seen in the games through the military faction. Indeed, the Ukrainian soldiers in the zone appear to be supplied directly by the Russian military. They have modern assault rifles, normally only used by Russian Spetsnaz, such as the Obokan and Groza, as well as a very large quantity of armored vehicles, helicopters, and so on. It is even said that when the zone appeared in 2006, the army tried to use a nuclear warhead to destroy it, which should be impossible, because Ukraine gave back all its nuclear weapons to Russia from 1994 to 2001. Perhaps the story about the nuclear bomb is just a rumor, but characters such as Sidorovich find it believable, so it has to make sense. My theory is that Ukraine and Russia are actually allies in this timeline, or at least there is some sort of agreement between the two nations. It's possible that Russia supplies the Ukrainian military and in exchange, the Ukrainian government shares the secrets defined in the zone, such as scientific discoveries, military usage of artifacts, ex-laboratory documents, and so on. Furthermore, the large influence of the USSR can still be felt in the zone. Russian language is commonly used among stalkers, and even Major Tektyrev's SBU card appears to be written in Russian, which should not be the case, since it's an official Ukrainian document. It's probably just an oversight by the developers, but who knows, you could see it as something more. And then there is the money in the zone. Rubles. Rubles are used in Russia and not in Ukraine, where the money is the Grivnia since 1996. However, if you look closely at the in-game textures for the money, you will realize these are not Russian rubles, but instead Soviet rubles. This does not mean the USSR is still standing, rather it's a smart way for people into the zone to have their own economy, detached and independent from the outside world. Since the Soviet ruble is not in use anymore, it has become a rarer money, which ensures a more stable economy for the artifact trade. By the way, this also explains why the prices in the Stalker games make no sense. An artifact for a couple thousand rubles? In Russian rubles, no thanks. But in Soviet rubles? 
who knows how much it's actually worth in the big land. Well, some prices still don't make sense when compared between themselves, but that's a topic for another time. 2008 Outbreak In Shadow of Chernobyl, the zone is said to have been born on April 12, 2008. This is explicitly written in the PDA Encyclopedia and correlates with the Military Investigation Report, which claims that the Agroprom Institute carried out undercover experiments from 2005 to 2008. However, this was changed in the following games, the zone now coming to be in 2006 instead of 2008. We can only speculate as to how and why this happened, but most believe this was a mistake by the developers. Indeed, design documents from the development of Shadow of Chernobyl already used the date of April 12, 2006 when referring to the second Chernobyl disaster. So it seems 2006 was always the correct year to begin with. Yet, the documents also reference that something important happened in 2008, even though what it was exactly is not clear. I won't enter into the details because these documents are technically not part of the lore, nevertheless they give the impression that the zone first appeared in 2006 and another kind of disaster followed in 2008. This could be the reason behind the mix-up in Shadow of Chernobyl. Now let's get to some theories. What if this second or I should say third disaster from 2008 actually happened in the lore? Sure, we are never told about it, but sometimes showing the player is better than feeding him exposition. And what can we observe in the games? secret laboratories and underground areas, which have been abandoned by the scientists and ransacked by mutants. My theory is that most X-Labs and other facilities inside the zone were not taken down by the 2006 disaster. Instead, their demise was sealed by another terrible event, which might very well be the 2008 outbreak. First of all, we know that such locations did continue to operate after the appearance of the zone. Artifacts can be found stored inside boxes in the labs, and the Gauss Rifle project was finished at the Jupiter factory using electro artifacts. The documents found in the factory also confirm that the weapons had to be transported underground to avoid anomalous activity so after the zone was born. Then many of the mutants in the zone, especially humanoid mutants, were created in the laboratories. It would not make sense for these creatures to flood the zone instantly following the 2006 disaster, yet we see them all around the zone by the time the games take place. It means the humanoid mutants must have somehow escaped the labs between 2006 and 2011. I believe such an event is what happened in 2008. For one reason or another, perhaps an unusually large emission followed by an earthquake, a large quantity of dangerous mutants broke free from the experiments and caused chaos in the underground facilities, eventually making their way to the surface of the zone. That's when the labs were finally abandoned, in an incident I like to call the 2008 outbreak. This would even fit the dates found in the investigation report, where we can read that the Agroprom Institute operated until 2008. Furthermore, the Sea Consciousness representative revealed that their Sci-Field network, which contains installations such as the Brain Scorcher, was activated some time after the zone was born in order to prevent curious people from getting to the center. Maybe these devices were put into use in 2008 
and have something to do with the catastrophe which struck the zone in that same year. In logs from LabX18, we learn that emissions from the informational field directed at living creatures will greatly increase their aggressiveness, something directly witnessed by the player in the form of zombified stalkers. Therefore, it is possible that when the psi machines were turned on, the emissions affected the test subjects inside the facilities, and gave them enough strength to break free and wreak havoc. This could have been the trigger to this third disaster, the fall of the X laboratories and the release of humanoid mutants into the zone. Shadow of Chernobyl is not canon. Shadow of Chernobyl is an old game. Yes, Clear Sky and Call of Pripyat came out quite fast afterwards, but there is a clear cut in the design between Shadow of Chernobyl and its two successors. The reason for this striking difference is that the development of Shadow of Chernobyl dragged on for years, hence the game is filled with ideas, texts and mechanics inherited from its long and tumultuous creation history. Because of this, there are many changes, retcons and plot holes separating Shadow of Chernobyl from the following games. Sure, Call of Pripyat also got some changes compared to Clear Sky, but due to the aforementioned reasons, most of the differences introduced between the games of the Stalker series appeared after Shadow of Chernobyl. The most obvious modifications were made to the game mechanics and gameplay, such as the complete revamp of the artifact system, or the update to weapons and armors following the introduction of technicians and equipment upgrades. The zone and its inhabitants have also seen some changes, with entire areas slightly reworked, mutant abilities and anomalous properties revamped, and so on. Many of these changes can be brushed over as insignificant, or explained through different methods. However, the contrast between Shadow of Chernobyl and the following games introduced inconsistencies in the stalker lore and story as well. There are many small plot holes, retcons and other weird anomalies in the storyline. For example, everything was set so that Scar would kill Feng, but it just never happened. Honestly, one could do an entire video dedicated to all these inconsistencies, but it's not what I want to do here. Instead, let's take a look at the biggest, most important element which screams Shadow of Chernobyl is not canon. It's ending. Shadow of Chernobyl has seven different endings, five of which are considered bad endings because the player reaches the wish grounder and succumbs to its power. The last two endings are known as the good endings, unlocked when the player infiltrates the monolith control center instead of going to make a wish. He is given a choice to help the sea consciousness by joining it, or to refuse and finally destroy the entity. The latter is the only ending perceived as the correct one by the general public not only because it extends the game to its conclusion, but also due to the fact that Strelok then appears in Call of Pripyat, meaning he came back from the power plant. Yet, apart from this encounter with Strelok, there is nothing telling us that this ending was actually what truly happened. In fact, let's analyze the appearance of Strelok in Call of Pripyat, shall we? My name is Strelok. You're the stalker who disabled the Scorcher? Yes, but my plan didn't work. My plan did not work. These are the words of Strelok himself. Everything is said here. What if the ending of Shadow of Chernobyl was Strelok's original plan, but as he states in Call of Pripyat, things did not go as planned, and what happened was something different from what we saw in Shadow of Chernobyl. To further back up this theory, let's continue our analysis 
by reading the conversation between the Tyref and Strelok. I'm sure the information I have can be used to destroy the zone. I thought I could do it myself, but it turned out to be far more complicated. The people who started it weren't in control anymore. I'll explain everything when we get out of here. What did you see in the sarcophagus? It's all fake. The monolith, the wish grunter, is just a lie. A device that clouds your mind. And the people behind it are hiding somewhere else. Do you know who is behind it? Maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know what to believe anymore. Despite that, I found out more than they wanted me to. So, first of all, Strelok claims that he wanted to destroy the zone, but was not able to. Remember that because it will be an important detail a bit later. Then he goes on to explain that the monolith is a deception, a machine which manipulated your mind, and the people who made it are still alive, hidden in an unknown area. If you take him word for word, he literally said that the sea consciousness, or whoever is behind it, was not destroyed, and remains active somewhere in the zone. Last but not least, Strelok admits that he is actually not sure of what and who he discovered in the sarcophagus. Put all these elements into the context of Shadow of Chernobyl's whole ending section, and you may start to doubt and ask some disturbing questions. Did Mark Twain's rampage inside the sarcophagus really happen? Did he actually disable the Wish Grunter device and met with the Sea Consciousness representative? Was he even Strelok to begin with? It's possible that the entire ending section of the game, from the moment you enter inside the sarcophagus, was simply an illusion created by the monolith, like a fever dream in which the character gets to accomplish his deepest wishes, discovering who he is and learning the secrets behind the 2006 disaster, and most importantly, making the zone disappear. Remember that in Call of Pripyat, Trelok said he wanted to destroy the zone? Well, in the so-called true ending of Shadow of Chernobyl, we see exactly that. After shooting down the sea consciousness, Strelok can be seen in a beautiful outside area, with green vegetation and chanting birds, which seems to indicate that the anomalous zone is no more. In fact, it looks exactly like the area from the bad ending, I want the zone to disappear, which is an illusion created by the wish grunter. Moreover, in the cutscene you can hear a strange noise resembling a voice. Some believe it is similar to the voice of the monolith, or to Psy voices, which can be heard when under the influence of a Psy field. Others prefer to think this is the distant voice of a scientist, who is currently performing an experiment on the character while he is hallucinating. As I'm sure you understand, the theory here is that Strelok's little adventure at the power plant did not really happen the way we experienced it in Shadow of Chernobyl. This may explain why we were able to fight against hordes of monolith soldiers alone, and why the final sequence with the teleports was quite weird and confusing. It is even possible that we were captured and brainwashed, which would tie up pretty well into the idea that the Strelok we meet in Call of Pripyat was a clone or an agent, sent by the sea consciousness to infiltrate and mislead the military. You may think this would be a stupid scenario, but in actual fact, 
it was a plot point in the now cancelled version of Stalker 2 from the early 2010s. Now, there is one big counter-argument to this theory we just presented. The state of the monolith faction in Call of Pripyat. Indeed, we can see in the game that monolith fighters have lost their link to the crystal, they don't receive orders anymore, and some of them even broke free from the brainwashing. This strongly suggests that the monolith device was truly destroyed and there's a good chance that they see consciousness as well. And so the mystery remains. Perhaps Strelok did manage to shut down the Wish Granter machine and weakened the sea consciousness without really ending it for good. Maybe he only hallucinated the last parts after a meeting with the representative. Who actually knows? Whatever it is, I think we should not take the ending of Shadow of Chernobyl for granted. As Strelok himself said, I don't know what to believe anymore. Well, we did it. When I created this iceberg back in January, I did not expect it to have such an impact, and I surely did not anticipate how long it would take to cover all of its layers. Today it is done. I really hope you enjoyed listening to my ramblings, and don't forget to share your own theories in the comments. Thank you for watching, Stalker, and goodbye.